Good morning, Rockingham. It's lovely to be worshipping you in the house of the Lord this morning. And thank you for the very warm welcome. I think this is the second time, is that right, Sheree? I think it's the second time we've been to Rockingham Church. And um, it's always good being back. We've got good friends here. And uh, the people are warm and friendly. It's always good. And I want to encourage you, what we had in Sabbath school this morning was special. We had a a very good lesson study up the front here for Sabbath school class. And it's it's hard, actually, to encourage people to come to Sabbath school. That's what we are finding in Victoria Park Church. But what I'm seeing here in your church is that your church is growing. The last time we came here, it was a lot fewer in number. So you must be doing something right. I'm not sure what it is. But praise God for that. I think uh, your uh, elder Tayton, he caught me one day as I was traveling to, to work during my internship. He, he caught me and he, he asked me to come to Rockingham to do a sermon. It's, I'm happy to come. But it's hard to get away from uh, Vic Park these days with the responsibilities that Shrey and I have in the church there. But um, thank you once again for the very warm uh, invitation and welcome. I would just invite you to bow your heads in prayer before we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we haven't come to hear the words of a man, or the philosophies of men, or perhaps their sermonizing. We've come to hear the word of God, and we pray, Lord, that you would grant us this blessing this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the people that have come to Rockingham Church, that they would leave here changed, that the word of God would have a sanctifying effect on each and every one of our lives this morning. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Socrates, if you're not familiar with him, is a very famous Greek philosopher who died an interesting death in his life. Socrates was on trial because he liked to ask questions. Probably much like the young children that were up the front this morning, Socrates had a very inquisitive mind. He was constantly questioning the leaders, those in authority and in um, power, in his day. And this troubled the leadership in the Greek society because it started to generate distrust among the constituency and they began to question that maybe the leaders of the society are not honest and maybe that people shouldn't trust trust them to lead and guide the nation. So Socrates was brought forward in front of them And they said to him, Socrates, this is the deal that we will put in front of you today. Stop asking questions to us leaders or we will send you away. We'll banish you to a far, far away land. Socrates' reply to them was, I'm not going to leave and I'm not going to stop asking questions. So they reconvened again, the leaders, and they thought to themselves, This guy here, he's a little bit stubborn. He's going to be hard to get rid of. So they thought they might up the pressure on him and said, Socrates, if you don't stop questioning us as leaders, we'll make you drink poison, hemlock, if you don't stop asking questions. And in response to this, his most famous statement is this. It says, if I cannot ask questions, then for me, I would rather not live because the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life isn't worth living. Another famous man in modern society by the name of Bertram Russell, Nobel Peace Prize winner, scientific mind, but also also an atheist. He was quoted in saying, unless you assume a God, the question of life's 
purpose is meaningless. What I would like to bring in front of you here today is a message about the meaning of life. And it's going to be challenging because we're going to try and cover it in about 30 minutes. But uh, I believe that we can catch a glimpse in God's word today on the purpose that he has for each one of us here. If you haven't discovered already, what is your purpose in life? Many people out in the world are searching, hungering, thirsting for something to fill that God-shaped hole in their life. One of my famous Christian authors by the name of C.S. Lewis, he writes, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should have never found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. I would encourage you here today to turn on your, on your switch on your minds and your thinking caps. One thing that I, I like to see is that when we come to church, it's not a place where we put aside reasoning and intellectual thought. It should be a place where, in God's word, where it says, come, let us reason together. And I believe that if you are religious, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that we aren't academic, we aren't thinking people. There, you see, there is this very seeking of this meaning in life that God has placed eternity in each one of your hearts here today. And there's something that troubles us with death, I believe. That my life, that your life, is racing to its end. For with each heartbeat, with each breath that I make, my, my life is getting closer to the end, closer to my last breath. We're, essentially, we're breathing to death. But there's this sense in the human heart that we don't have a lot of time, so we want to try and make the most of our time, live life to the fullest, we often hear people say, go out there and experience life, and you better enjoy it while you can. These are sort of things that we hear all the time, especially in the world around us. This morning I would like to present to you what I believe to be the three main approaches to how people tackle this meaning of life. And the majority of worldwide, worldwide beliefs that this encompasses. The first and the first approach comes in the form of Eastern religions, where they simply deny there is even a meaning or a purpose to be found. According to Lord Krishna in his scriptures on Hinduism, humanity must be cut out of the dark forest of delusion. Your desire for purpose is an illusion. There is no purpose for your life. The problem is the desire. And so Buddhism and Hinduism alike, it's all about removing yourself from these desires, this, this thirst that God has placed in our heart. It's all about denying your desires, maybe your desires to get married one day, your desires for success, your desires for, for peace, whatever it may be, for happiness. They think that you're troubled you're, you're unsettled because you have this desire in you. Thus, they say that you must reach this place called nirvana, this place of so-called enlightenment, where you're completely detached from, from the world around you, even detached from yourself. And so in the Eastern mindset, freedom is not to be an individual. It's from being an individual. It's about losing yourself and it's about emptying your mind. That's the first. The second approach to this meaning of life comes in the form of the atheists, agnostic, and those naturalists around us who deny that there is a meaning in life as well. They deny that there is nothing beyond that tangible, nothing that we can touch or nothing that we can see with our eyes, nothing beyond, no reality beyond that. They would say that you need to decide your own purpose for life. You decide your life. 
and you decide what it ought to be. They would say there is no inherent purpose. It's what you make of it. You are the author of your own story. And as our mothers often say, if you make your bed, you have to sleep in it as well. But lastly, tackling the meaning of life, is the Christian and the Judaical view in which is to discover the meaning. And what we need to understand is if there is something to be discovered, if there's an object to be sought, it must pre-exist the search or pre-exist the seeker trying to find that. Just as there can't be a calling without a caller in the first place. But before I get into this, I would like to explain in the word of God this morning. Turn with me, if you can, to Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very first verse of the Bible. As we try and grapple with the concept of meaning and purpose for our life this morning. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1 to 2. And it reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters. Uh, sorry, face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In this very first verse of the Bible, we can get a glimpse, we can get an understanding of the purpose for each of our lives this morning. In fact, if we look at this verse, this phrase here in verse 1, in verse 2, that says, without form and void, in the Hebrew, I would challenge you to go back and to look in your concordance Look into the original meaning of this word without form and void in your, in your Bible. And you'll find something very interesting that jumps out at you. You'll find, you'll come across this word that says tohu wa bohu, which means waste and void, chaos, form, sort of formless, in fact. And what we can get an understanding of from the very first verse in God's word in the Bible is that our God, the God that we worship, moves and works among the midst of chaos. It's encouraging for me, and I don't know, it should be encouraging for you here today as well. Because I don't know, perhaps your, your marriage might be going through chaos or, or it might be going through troubled, troubled times. Maybe your family is breaking apart and you're losing it's become formless, or whatever it may be. It's your friendship. It's your job. But we can take comfort in knowing that we serve and worship a God that works amongst chaos, and that can turn chaos, something without even a form, into something special. And so we can understand in God's word that we have a purpose that preceded our own existence, we had a purpose for our life. Jump across with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. As I take you on a story this morning of a man that a lot of us may know, Solomon, King Solomon. It's been told that Solomon wrote Songs of Solomon in his youth, Proverbs in his middle age, and Ecclesiastes as a, as a more senior man in his life. Starting from verse 2, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, which reads, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Not about you. If we just closed the Bible right here and then, and then left and went home, 
that would be that would be meaningless in fact maybe if we didn't understand the context the background and what Solomon was trying to get at here and what a way in fact what a way to start a book to say that in the very first introduction of your book that you've written is that it's all meaningless everything is meaningless unless you know the author or understand the importance of God's word and here is Solomon saying in this verse, he's saying that here is my thesis from the very beginning. Everything in life under the sun has no meaning. Let me explain this further. Continue in verse 3, which reads, What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? We need to ask ourselves this question. We live in a state, a fly-in, fly-out state that's heavily affected by mining and the economic boom and, this, and like. We get very, very carried away. And even our churches have become fly-in, fly-out churches where we have people that fly in, but how many people are willing to, to serve God in the church? We get caught up in this materialistic society with all our, our labor all our wants in this world. I'm preaching to myself just as much as to all of us this morning that after all our hard labors in this world, what truly have you got to show for yourself? And what better person to, to tell us this than King Solomon that had everything you can imagine? And here is King Solomon towards the latter end of his life with all the riches, wealth, fame that you can imagine through all the hard years of his labor, and he is saying that is all meaningless. All the hard years of labor had no meaning for him. What can you say that you have truly achieved with your life? What have you gained? What can you say that you possess now? What have you done with your life? Continue with me to verse 4. It reads, one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Continuing in verse 5, the sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south and twirls about to the north and the wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run to the sea, yet the sea is not full. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye isn't satisfied with seeing, nor the ear satisfied with hearing. Here Solomon is taking an analogy from nature and human, humans as well. Where he's, he's looking at nature and he's seeing rivers that continually flow into the ocean. He's seeing these natural processes in the world around us where the wind keeps on turning around, the sun rises and the sun sets. And he's saying, he's comparing it to our life as humans when we're working. He's saying that this life on this earth, it's at the end of the day, he's comparing it to the wealth and he's saying that it's all meaningless. It, it all starts again afresh. This is the ultimate quest behind the purpose and meaning of life. As I mentioned earlier, none of us like dying. None of us like the idea of death. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to die an insignificant life. There's something in my heart, and I'm sure it's in your heart here today, that says that you were supposed to see something before you died, or perhaps you were supposed to hear something before you died. There's supposed to be an end point for us. You have run the race. You have fought a good fight. And then we're ready to die. But how many people can you go up today, even in the church this morning, or churches around, and ask them, are you, are you ready to pass on? Are you ready to meet your maker? You can take me, Lord, because I've seen what I need to see. I've heard what I need to hear. We keep waking up every morning 
and we keep seeking. This is the sickness of the society of the world that we live in today, a materialistic, superficial society that is chasing rainbows, chasing shadows, if you like, where they can never be caught. And so we can compare it to an analogy of a rocking horse, if you like. The difference between motion and progress. Do you know what I mean? We go through the motions in our lives, even as Christians. You come to church, even if you are at church, maybe you're busy. I know I get very busy in my Christian life as well. A lot of running around, a lot of busyness, a lot of here, there, to, fro. But if we think back in our life, maybe last year, 2014, have we grown closer to the Lord? Have we developed a deeper relationship with God? Have we overcome, through God's grace, some of the challenges and struggles that each one of us personally have? And so there's this difference between motion, simply rocking backwards and forwards, going nowhere, and progress, reaching, moving, making advancement in our lives. Where are we going? You know, we can even compare it to a famous Greek myth, which is the G Greek myth of Sisyphus. And if you're not aware of this man, this myth involves a man that was banished by the Greek god Zeus. And Zeus told him that for eternity, this man Sisyphus was to push this boulder up the hill. And once it gets to the very top, he would let it roll back down again. And for eternity, this man Sisyphus was pushing this boulder up and letting it roll back down again, and then pushing back all the way back up again endless, unavailing. And so people often say, if you've heard before, that this is a Sisyphean task. It means that this task will never be accomplished. It will never reach its end. And so you and I, we can take a lesson from this story. You and I go to work, or perhaps we're studying, or whatever it may be in our lives. We are pushing this boulder. We are pushing this boulder all the way up. We start on Sunday, because Sabbath we're resting. We're pushing the boulder up, up, up. Friday, we're at the top. And then next week again, it rolls all the way back down again. Next week, Monday comes again. When do you push the boulder up and it stays at the top of the hill? Maybe you're asking yourself, I think I'll just go back and get this last degree. Or perhaps, you know, you're just longing for that job promotion where you know where you're going to bring in that extra income that's going to be provide you with you know, the peace and the settlement in your life. Or maybe you're thinking if you can just find that perfect partner, if you're single, that perfect wife or husband. Or if you can buy another investment, another house. If you can just better yourself in some way. We're simply pushing up the boulder, friends. Pushing up the boulder up the hill. And the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is what is all this availing to us? So you can even take an, an example from God's church, God's early church. Look at the Israelites in the wilderness, walking around. How many years do they walk around in the wilderness? Forty years for an 11 days journey. Can you imagine? Forty years for an 11 days journey. These people were simply in motion, not progress. These people were like that rocking horse, rocking forward, backwards and forwards, not going anywhere. Spiritually, we can look in, our, in the church, God's church around us here today and ask ourselves, are we any better? Can we take a lesson, a leaf from their book and learn from their mistakes of the early church? We come to church perhaps every Sabbath, we listen to how many sermons, and probably in a week's time you'll forget my sermon. It, every week we come, but simply we ask ourselves the, this question, you know, what, what progress are we making? We might be able to, you know, learn so many different things about the health message 
you know, good diet, exercise, and I believe in all those things, and I believe in the health ministry. But what, what purpose is that? Is all these things that we do as a church, if we are not doing our sole purpose, and that is to reach people for God. So we ask ourselves, are we making progress? Come back with me to Ecclesiastes and jump across to chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 in verse 1. It says, I said in my heart, come now I will test you with mirth. Therefore enjoy, what's that word? Pleasure. But surely this was also vanity. Very interesting. Solomon begins his search for purpose and significance in his life. And the first place that he turns to? Pleasure. Solomon says, in fact, that he turned to pleasure to such a degree that he gratified every aspect of pleasure. Continue in verse 10 to and 11 with me, if you, if you would, in chapter 2. Verse 10, which reads, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from, for all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and the labor on which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity. The grasping for the wind, there was no profit under the sun. Solomon is, is talking to you and I here this morning. He's saying, you who are seeking all these things in your life, materialism, I had it all. He had so much wealth that silver became of almost no value in Solomon's time. Relationships, Solomon had, or had women, he had so much, he had fame, he had fortune. But notice, importantly, all his pursuits of happiness and significance in his life came by trying to give things to himself, a selfish life. So continuing in verse 4 of chapter 2, Solomon says, I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens or orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all were in Jerusalem before me. So you see King Solomon here. He's living a selfish life, trying to gratify and fulfill the purpose and meaning. We need to take a lesson from his book here this morning and to see that when you are just living a selfish life, a life for yourself, you are headed I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, but you're headed to the same conclusion that King Solomon was headed to, and that everything is vanity, everything is meaningless. Sometimes, well, we, we always have this human nature in our mind that we, we constantly think if we can just reach out and get that bit more, we will be satisfied. It's just like an addiction. I don't know if you've gone through an addiction or you know someone that is addicted to something, whatever it may be. They think that if they just have that one more, one more hit, one more whatever it is, that they'll be, they'll be quenched, that thirst will be quenched. It just desires to desire. It never satisfies. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, which reads... He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work from the beginning to the end. He has put eternity in your hearts, brothers and sisters. He has placed, he has created and shaped this God-shaped void, if you like, in the human heart. There is a cry of Ecclesiastes, not only in the church, but in the world around us today. That's why people are longing for the truth of the gospel, the precious truths that we can provide and we can witness to them. Through God's word, through the help of God and the Holy Spirit, we can help fill this void that people have in their lives. Friends, I want, to think, I want you to think about this for a second. Everything in your life that you do, what is it for? We all make sacrifices. We all go through hard times, difficulties, job losses perhaps. We all even come to, sometimes we come to church discouraged. But ask yourself this question, what is it all for? You know, we can think of all the people in God's word, in the Bible, that could have said that life is meaningless. It wasn't Jesus that was born to die. It wasn't Adam who lost paradise. It wasn't even uh, Job that, some, that suffered the greatest amount of suffering that a human being can endure. It came from the lips of him who had every pleasure that you can imagine. He had everything. He was the one that said life is meaningless. And so we can understand that this sickness called meaninglessness or no purpose in your life comes from a weariness of pleasure, not pain. In fact, that's why first in first world countries, the suicide rate is so high because we have so much to live for, but so little. Sorry, so much to live with, but so little to live for. Come across with me as we come to a close this morning to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. which reads, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. This constant thirst, this constant hungering in the human heart, if it cannot be quenched, if it cannot be succumbed and satisfied, it will push us, it, will push, it has pushed people to depression. It's like, I don't know if you've ever experienced an unquenchable thirst. Perhaps, you know, you've had a long day and you want something to drink and you've had a, a, have a soda or you've had an orange, some kind of juice, hoping, longing that it would quench your thirst. Only knowing afterwards it's leaving you more thirsty than when you started. This constant thirst and hunger. I'd like to finish back in Genesis where we started this morning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. As we continue the quest for meaning and purpose in our life. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Which reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He. This, I'd look, like to look at this word, he, capital H, important to know, he. This enmity comes in the form of a special male child, Jesus Christ. This he that the Bible is talking about in Genesis starts here and through the whole Bible Everyone is searching for this he to 
overcome this enmity between Satan and man. So for the rest of the Bible, everyone's chasing after this. Who is this he? Who could he be? If we look in Genesis, we can understand when Eve gave birth, her first son was Cain. The meaning of the word Cain, if you go back and research the meaning of the word Cain, it means acquired a man. She acquired a man from the Lord. This was her firstborn child. And in fact, in the Bible, why is it that the firstborn is so significant, so important in the lineage of the family? It's because in Genesis here, from the very first uh, question posed, is that they're looking for this he that's coming. And when she gave birth to her second son, Abel, she named him because that name, sad to say, means breath or vapor. It just means you know, vanity. It's worthless, as sad to say, because she had already acquired a man from the Lord. In Eve's mind, Eve was hoping that this perhaps, could this be the saviour? Could this be the, the he, the capital H, coming, this enmity, to give us purpose and meaning in life? Eve was wrong. It wasn't Cain. It wasn't Seth. It wasn't Enoch. It wasn't even Adam. First born in the lineage. Come with me. Last, last text. Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. Haggai chapter 2, reading from verse 7. Which says, And I will shake the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. This desire. That's why the book, if you haven't read it already, is called The Desire of Ages. If you haven't, I would encourage you to read it. You see, there is no meaning without Jesus Christ, friends. Through every book of the Bible, They're searching for this he, this enmity, Jesus Christ to come. They're looking for he. And this is the same same experience that I have gone through, even as a Christian, in my Christian life. I've gone through times where I've even questioned my faith, questioned my purpose in life. And I want to encourage you, even for the young people that are here today, those that are aspiring to start their careers. Not all of us can be preachers, uh, paid preachers or, or elders or you know, different responsibilities, different gifts to different people. But I would encourage you, young people, in whatever position, whatever career that God has directed you in your life, I pray that through that career, that God will give you purpose and he will direct you to reach out for people to God. I believe that in everything that we do, we should be able to reach souls for God. You see, this he, this enmity, was made flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And God says to us that he's willing, he was willing to come down willing to give up everything for you and I. The desire of ages. But what did we do when he came here? What did we do to Jesus? Rejected, smitten, despised by men. The very desire, the very God-shaped thing, object that would fill and quench the desires in our human heart, when we got it, when we received it, we pushed it away. Brothers and sisters, for many years before I was baptized, I was pushing away this God-shaped hole in my heart. And I pray if there's anyone here today that perhaps is, have pushed away God, that you would allow him back into your heart this morning. I pray that 
through the word this morning that you would please take it on your heart and rededicate and recommit your, your life to God this morning. It's my humble prayer. Amen.